to uh, input to on this camera.
How some carriers give you so little for your older busted phone you just end up living with it? I don't think so. Verizon lets you trade in your broken phone for a shiny new one. You break it, we upgrade it. You dunk it, doggy bone it, <laughs> slam it, wham it, strawberry jam it, we upgrade it. Get a 5G phone on us with select plans. Every customer, current, new, or business. Because everyone deserves better. And with plans starting at just $35, better cost less than you think. Hey folks, today is Thursday, November 18th, 2021. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live from Glen County, Georgia on the Black Star Network. Uh, the focus today, Black Pastures gathering here. The attention is on the Ahmaud Arbery family. It was at last week where one of the white attorneys for the three men accused of killing him called out Reverend Jesse Jackson, Senior Reverend Al Sharpton, and said they didn't want black pastors in the courtroom. Well, black pastors responded. A lot of folks out here we would talk with. Uh, Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter, he was out here. They also marched with the Transform Justice Coalition. Uh, we'll hear from Barbara Arnwine also. Uh, we'll talk with uh, Ben Dixon of the Ben Dixon Podcast. He was broadcasting out here as well. The men who were convicted of killing Malcolm X, they are now officially uh, charges have been dropped at, that came down uh, today. Uh, in uh, in uh, New York City, and so we'll talk about that as well. Lots more to talk about what took place here. You have the Kyle Rittenhouse trial going on. The governor of Oklahoma finally commutes the sentence of uh, Julius Jones, uh, and so he was not put to death today. Lots to discuss. That's next. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's bring the funk. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, it's on go, 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 y'all. Yeah, it's rolling, Martin. Yeah, yeah. Rolling with rolling now. I pat. This, this folks here, this is a this was a drone shot that we, uh, earlier today uh, where black pastors, they gather here at the Glenn County Courthouse uh, in Georgia. This is where uh, the three white men who are on trial for killing Ahmaud Arbery, uh, where it is taking place. Uh, several hundred gathered here. Other people here uh, as well. Uh, they, they were out here. There were, of course, uh, numerous folks who were speaking. Uh, you had um, uh, folks with their signage. Again, black pastors showed up uh, sh and showed out. Uh, they had signs and shirts saying Black Pastors Matter, uh, and it was all in, in support of standing with the Ahmaud Arbery family. Uh, it was last week where one of the white attorneys uh, went to court and actually tried to block Black Pastors. Go back to the iPad, please, folks. Uh, but it wasn't just that. So you'll see the people who were out there, who were here. Uh, you, will, you will see them. Uh, they were out there. Uh, they were preaching. They were praying. Uh, they wanted a show of force to let uh, folks in this uh, city, in this county, know that African Americans uh, are going to stand with the Arbery family. There were pastors from all across Georgia, all across the country, uh, who were here, uh, who decided to come here uh, as a show uh, of force. Uh, and again, uh, it was uh, it was uh, a really great scene. Uh, attorney Ben Crump, Attorney Lee Merritt, others uh, standing with the family. Uh, they were out here as well. Like I said, uh, they had the signs. People were out here. Uh, as early as uh, 7, 7 o'clock this morning. Uh, initially, uh, the rally, the prayer vigil was supposed to start 
uh, around 11 a.m. Reverend Al Sharpton's plane was delayed. Uh, he did not get here till almost 12:30, uh, and then they started uh, the, uh, the the they started the uh, the vigil really around 1:15. Uh, and so uh, di- different members of the Aubrey family they spoke, uh, including uh, Marcus Aubrey, his father, also his sister. Uh, she spoke as well, and so that's that was taking place here. Uh, and so we're going to keep showing you, keep rolling that video. Um, and then later, of course, uh, every Thursday, they have a march from the courthouse into the community to an Ahmad Arbery mural uh, that's several blocks away. We live stream that event just, just like we live stream this event right here. Uh, and so we're going to show some of that. So stay on this video. Uh, joining us right now is Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Cliff, uh, it was uh, it was great to see people. Uh, turn out to stand with this family. That's what it was all about. It wasn't about a photo op. It wasn't about any of that. It was letting this family know they are not alone. That's right, definitely. Letting letting this family know that they're not alone, but also letting this entire community know that it's not alone because these issues are affecting this entire Brunswick Glen County community. So it was very important for folks to come here. And to what what I've been talking about is the importance of bearing witness, right? You know, bearing witness is something that's got it's got spiritual importance, right? Like you 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 got to be able to bear witness, or else you can't you can't uh, uh, have people appreciate what the miracle is, right? And unless somebody's bear witness that the stone has been moved and the body is no longer in the grave, then then you can't appreciate the miracle, right? But in this context, bearing witness is also important, because in bearing witness, we help tell a story about what's going on in this courthouse. In bearing witness, we actually put pressure and bring correction, because the fact of the matter is the defense attorney told on himself and told the truth when he said that having these black pastors inside the courtroom is intimidating, right? It's distracting. What we know is that they have filed motion after motion trying to even get uh, uh, Barbara and Daryl, Transformative Justice Coalition, who's been here since day one, trying to get them out of here, trying to get black pastors out of here. And every minute that they spend filing a motion like that, guess what? That's one less minute that they have telling the lies that they've been telling in the story about the way that they hunted down and murdered. Here's some video. Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., he was out here, uh, of course, marching with the young folks, marched with the Transformative Justice Coalition uh, as well. Uh, and he he made it perfectly clear that he, he, wanted, he wanted to be out here. Right. Uh, and so so to, to your point there about uh, to your point there about uh, the family about uh, what these attorneys doing I mean I mean you know they've been playing the white supremacy card as hard as possible that is they want black people silenced they literally tried to they they, they tried to stop uh, Marcus Arbery from even looking at the jury I mean serious. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's the epitome of trying to control our bodies, right? You want to even control not just whether we're present in the courtroom. You want to control who I look at or, or, or how I look. Or, or what I have on, or, or you know, or even what mask. He, he made a point about saying somebody had on, a, I don't know if it was a Black Lives Matter or a Black Voters Matter mask on. But, yeah, but that's the that's the point, that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of yokes that need to be broken in this community. And it's communities like this. It's like Brunswick and Glen County and, and, and other rural, smaller, smaller communities. And so that's why it's so important that we be present here for this trial to deal with this very specific issue to get justice for Ahmad and his family in this community but there's a range of there's actually a mayor's election taking place right now in this community and there's issues on the ballot like confederate monuments and housing issues you know this is a very you've been here right you can see the the disparities in this community on the one hand you come down the street and there's a yacht club but on the other hand, when you do this march through the community that we just did, you see you see uh, uh, vacant houses and dilapidated blocks and, and, and things of that nature, right? Uh, there's, so there's there's yokes that need to be broken in this community. The the the, the forces that led to these three uh, lynchers, murders. Uh, hold tight one second. For some reason, we lost Cliff's audio. I, I, I don't know why. Uh, so it looks like we got the look like we got the audio back. Uh, you know, and, and okay. So guys, talk to me. Do, do we have audio or not? I don't understand how we're losing audio. Cliff, go ahead and talk. Let's see if you uh, Test, see the can- testing one two three Brunswick, Georgia. Justice for Ahmad. Okay, okay, guys in the control room, listen, me and Cliff are on the same line. Okay, listen, we're on the same line. You lose Cliff, you lose me. Okay, so y'all got to work that out. 
All right, Cliff. Uh, I gotta ask, so on that particular point, uh, that particular point there, when you talk about the work that y'all do, that's what people need to understand. The DAs that initially did not step up to, to prosecute these three white men, those are elected positions. And so for the people out there, uh, and I saw some of them on our YouTube page and our Facebook page saying, oh, oh, no, you know, all this marching stuff doesn't, that doesn't work. It does, it, you know, it's ineffective. They're lying. They don't understand. You have, to, you have to organize, mobilize in order to galvanize the people to create change. Right. And even events like this are still organizing and mobilizing events. Right. So one of the things that we do when we do these marches, I've done a couple with Barbara and Daryl now. And again, hats off to them for being here since day one. But when we do the marches through the community without fail, one of the things that we do is we say to folks that are watching, because there's always folks on the side of the street watching. Sometimes they're doing the cameras and doing Facebook Live or whatever. And we always shout out to them and say, hey, come on and join us. Come get on this caravan. Come get in the streets. We got a spot for you in these streets because guess what? These streets are our streets. And so when you use at the, if you if you go back to the Selma to Montgomery March, that was the same thing that, that uh, Kwame Torrey, Stokely Carmichael at the time and, and Snick did. They weren't just marching. They peeled off the march in places like Lowndes County and, and organized things like the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. So when we have events like this, when we have trials like this, when we do marches like this, this isn't just performative, right? This is something, it's an organizing tool because at the end of the day, we got to bring more people into this process. And when we do that, we can we can win elections, we can we can beat DAs. The DA that first tried to bury this case is no longer DA because this community found a way to take his pain and turn it into power and got rid of that DA. We can do that when we use these, these opportunities. We shouldn't be in this situation. Situation. We want Ahmad to be here, but if what's going to happen is, is what happened, then we need to find a way to turn that pain and turn it into power and to organize our communities. I mean, you said something there, and i got to ask you this here. Just the other day, uh, Derek Johnson, who leads the NAACP, made a comment at the uh, march that took place in D.C., fighting for voting rights, where uh, he basically dissed those who had been getting arrested, calling it performative. Well, last I checked, that's how the NAACP got to be the NAACP. In fact, out here, I didn't see many NAACP signs. And so when you hear that comment, and, I, and, and I'm, I've got my folks working on the book, Derek, I want to hear what the hell he, mean by, he means by that. Um, protest is not performative. It's the First Amendment. Protest is how the pressure was put, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, on the governor of uh, Oklahoma, to commute the death sentence of Julius Jones. And so I'm trying to, and he, he mentioned, well, you know, we filed these lawsuits and we are calling on athletes not to sign with Texas teams. Well, is that is that performative? I mean, so when you hear that, when you hear that, that to me also uh, is depressing to the people who we are trying to get excited on an issue. And if you are willing enough to come out with a sign and stand in the heat, and March, that means you're more, you're probably willing to go an extra step. That's right, exactly. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's just what you said. You've got to be willing to recognize, you know, Malcolm says by any means necessary, and there are lots of different ways you can interpret that. But one of the ways that we interpret it is that you've got to be willing to use every tool that we have at our disposal. And, yeah, there's a space for, for, for lawsuits. We file lawsuits. Life goes bad. There's a bunch of lawsuits right now. But that doesn't stop us from also saying, but we got to organize our people. we got to do some marches. we got to organize to win some elections. And, yes, we got to get alert, arrested. Because, as you said, it demonstrates to the opposition how far you are willing to go to get the demands that you are seeking. I don't know anybody that would talk about Dr. King in a letter from Birmingham jail and say that was just performative because he got arrested. Or that the children in the Birmingham march, the children's crusade, who got arrested in spite of dogs and firehouses, that that was just performative. Or as we're fighting for this voting rights battle right now, that the people that got on the bridge in Selma to go to Montgomery, that that was just performative. It's more than that. That's part of what energizes folks. It's part of what educates folks. It raises awareness. 
and again, it sends a message to your opposition that when we say we want voting rights, that we are serious. When we say that we want justice for Ahmad, that we are serious and we are willing to put our bodies on the line and to be arrested and to pay fees. I had to spend a night in the D.C. jail. I'm going to tell you right now, there ain't nothing performative about spending a night in the D.C. jail, right? You've got to be serious about what it is that you're fighting for when you're willing to go to those lengths. And when we do that, we send a message to, to the other folks that we're trying to pull in this, in this process that we are serious and we want you to be a part and that there's space for you. And not everybody has to go to jail. Every, there's a role for everybody to play, but part of how we get people willing to play these roles, to, whether it's to cook or to, or to sing at an event or to, or to send a text, when they see us willing to go to certain lengths, it sends a message and it gets more people involved. And I, I, and I wish that the NAACP at the national level, because I want to be clear, we do a lot of work with NAACP chapters in, 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 in different communities, and they're down for some of these actions. They do some of these actions, right? We we just would love to see if at the highest level that instead of criticizing, quote unquote, performative actions, if they would support some of these actions, because we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Right. We've got nothing against lawsuits, but you best believe that we got to do that and all these other tactics that we got to do, because we're not oppressed through one mechanism and we're not going to overcome our oppression right. through just one mechanism. All right. Cliff Albright, co-founder of Black Voters Matter. Man, I appreciate it. Thank always you, good Rose. to see you on the front lines. Thank you. You always, you always show up for our people, and we appreciate that so much. I appreciate it, brother. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, I want to bring in my panel right now, folks, uh, to talk about uh, this and some other issues. Uh, uh, we have uh, Greg Carr, of course, uh, uh, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, Reese Colbert, Black Women Views, Faraji Muhammad, uh, radio and TV host. Glad to have you here. In a moment, we're going to talk to Ben Dixon. Uh, he's going he's to jo join us as well. Ben's going to join us uh, on the panel here uh, to talk about this here. Let me, um, let me, let me start uh, with you, Greg, uh, and that is uh, it was uh, to see the folks out here to, uh, to uh, Cliff's Point, uh, to Clear Cliff, you can go ahead, uh, to Cliff's Point, uh, you you know what's important uh seeing the voices and seeing the people and in fact i'm gonna do i'm gonna do this here let me um try to grab my uh i've got a couple of things here i'm trying to grab my ipad thanks a lot cliff um uh, I, I know folks uh i got it uh but uh i want to try something here uh because greg we were we live streamed this a little bit earlier uh and that is as i said uh, Barbara Arnwine and uh, the Transform Justice Coalition, uh, they said every Thursday they have done uh, a march uh, through the community. Uh, they were led by uh, the children uh, today. Uh, I want to show that video if we can. Uh, and when people gather, when people are mobilizing, organizing, it matters. It matters. And it's also important if you were fam if, if if your son was killed, you know I would damn sure feel a hell of a lot better if four or five hundred people showed up to stand with me uh, to oppose these races uh, representing these three white men, these white races who kill Ahmaud Arbery. Yes, yes, Roland. And in fact, <clears throat> I, by the way, I want to uh, to again honor you and, and anyone who didn't watch last night the interview you did with Ahmaud Arbery's father. You really. Please go back and watch that. Um, you know, it means the world for folks to have support. Uh, the first time I saw, in fact, Reverend Barber in person, uh, I was campus advisor that year for the uh, Howard uh, NAACP student chapter, and they convinced me to ride a bus as their chaperone from D.C. to Raleigh for a weekend rally. And at that time, Reverend Barber was, uh, I believe he was the statewide president of NAACP at the time. And, of course, that was part of the work that led to Moral Mondays and the challenges in Raleigh that had built and beginning to build that coalition in North Carolina, people of goodwill. Uh, I say that to emphasize what, um, what we just heard from Cliff. The distinction between the local NAACP and the national NAACP, that tension has been there since the founding of the NAACP. Since the NAACP in the 1920s and 30s, at the national level began to pursue the courts as their primary strategy. And the local branches of the NAACP have always had tension. Remember the, the, uh, the battle between Mecca Everett in Mississippi and Roy Wilkin at the national level. So it's always been there, that, that's not unusual. The only other thing I would say is, and I think this is a larger point, the tensions are being heightened in this country as it pulls itself apart by not taking head on white nationalism. What we're seeing is uh, civil society 
And this looks very much closer to South Africa, uh, to everywhere from Poland to Brazil. People are in the streets. And what you see is civil society, not just clergy, is confronting the state. And this is becoming, this is heightening the tensions between human rights campaign, not just civil rights campaign, but human rights struggles and a state apparatus that has proven itself either unwilling or unable to defend our basic human rights. And so this development, as you said, finally, is really an exercise in showing the state that you are not in charge. You are not in charge. And, and this will not go away. In fact, we've seen this before in American history. So, uh, more power to everyone there, including you for covering it, Roland. Reese, um, you know, this is when you look at this particular case here, um, the uh, you had, uh, again, uh, the defense uh, presenting their case again, uh, trying to make the argument. Uh, and it was shameful uh, to hear uh, these folks talk about how they were afraid they were in danger. I'm sorry. Three white men in trucks with guns chasing a black man down the street. And they're the ones who were afraid. Really? <laughs> You're not going to give me the cussing already, <laughs> Roland. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's completely asinine. It's gaslighting. You know, it, it's as though people don't understand that black people are human beings, not prey to be hunted upon. Um, I saw that the defendant said that um, Ahmaud Aubrey was acting weird. Yeah, you know, I would be acting really weird if some white man in a damn pickup truck was following behind me. You dog all right. I'm gonna get a little. I'm gonna get a little jittery, right? And I would run for the hills too. And that's what um, Ahmaud Aubrey was faced. But he had no choice but to run because he wasn't armed. Unlike these vigilante slave patrol racists and modern day lynchers. And so it's it's incredibly offensive that you know white people seem to believe that there are overseers and that we have to not only. Um, answer to them. We have to show deference to them in a way that's unthreatening to them when they are threatening our existence and our autonomy to move about this world in a very safe and 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 free way. As they said, he didn't th he didn't yell out any threats to them. He didn't acknowledge them. He wasn't even verbal with them. He simply mm -hmm. was running. And that is his, well, that was his prerogative to do. And so it, 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 this is just so offensive. But, you know, I, I thought it was a really strange comment um, to, to call these kind of protests performative. I, I think what Cliff said, there is a role for everybody is so important. I mean, listen, everybody doesn't believe in the electoral process. We may preach it on here, the importance of voting in local elections and how the DA was voted out, for instance. Judges are voted on in most cases. If not voted on, they're appointed by people that we vote into office. But there are people who um, who may not believe in that, but they believe in getting out in the streets and making their voice heard. And there, there needs to be visibility, especially when it comes to Black issues, because with us, it's out of sight, out of mind. And it shouldn't mm -hmm. need, we shouldn't need to parade our pain for the entire country to feast upon in order to get some empathy and to get some measure of justice. But that's the the that's the reality that we live in. And so my hats are off to anybody who's getting involved in any way that they see fit. Lawsuits, there's a place for it. There's but there's absolutely a place for people to be out in the streets because the these these uh these folks are out in the street, these anti CRT people are out at these board, at these education board meetings, you know, these insurrectionists were out. These people are showing up to see JFK Jr. come back from the dead and be vice president. So, you know, there are plenty of people that are out on the streets for plenty of causes. This is a hundred percent certainly this vote rights and a, and a number of other ones are certainly causes that warrant us being out in the street. Everybody that's out there is doing a great service to the Aubrey family and to the community at large. Mm -hmm. um, Faraji, uh, today uh, in the courtroom with the defense, uh, they arrested, they called a total of seven witnesses uh, today. And again, mm -hmm. they contend that they uh, were there to make a citizen's arrest of Ahmaud Arbery but, of course, never saw that he took anything, had no idea if he took anything, didn't really know if it was he was actually the person uh, they were looking for. They even said, oh, there was these rash of break-ins uh, in the neighborhood. But then the prosecutor said, I'm sorry, there were only four reported break car break-ins uh, in in uh, in one year. What do you, what happened to all of this rash? Uh, and so, I mean, 
you see what is going on here, and the bottom line is uh, they're trying their best uh, to sit here and and get uh, try to try to get off. But the bottom line is this really should is, is a closed and shut case, and it should not take this jury long at all. Closing arguments will be on Monday. Should not take the jury long at all to say, nah, these three guilty. Take your butt to prison for the rest of your lives. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And and I think the big part of this is something I'm going to say with that. I'm going to go back to Reese's point. I mean, Travis McMichael admitted on the stand that Ahmaud Arbery did not present or pose to be any threat before they started taking out the guns and started the chase after this brother. He didn't pose any threat. I mean, he's literally running. He's running through the neighborhood. They have they have footage of him running through the neighborhood. Um, from from different cameras, nothing is being touched. Nothing, is, you know. He's going through these homes and con- constructed homes. Nothing is happening. And so when we see all of this, it just goes to show you that. And I'm going back to the VC and Dr. Carr's point, it just goes to show you that this level of white entitlement that is pro- that is that is so that's permeating throughout this country, where you can't even just walk through a neighborhood. I mean, this is the neighborhood Ahmaud Arbery all has been running through for for many times. And at this point, it's like you you can't even do that so much in, anymore, and and it's absolutely mind blowing that that they took it upon themselves and that they they want the court, they want the people to really believe it. They grasping for straws at this point. They come up with any type of excuse to give them some justification for the killing of this brother. I hope they just take. I tell. I hope they do just come to a very quick decision and put all their asses behind bars. But more importantly. More importantly, this process of organizing black folks, man, we got to make sure that when we organize, we organize, we have a goal in mind. We got to make sure that when we organize, we're all on, and pretty much try to be on the same page because it's not a good look when the national president of the NAACP is calling them protesters uh, performative. It's not a good look when you, when, when that's what the NAACP, as you say, Brother Roland, has been doing, that's how you get the next generation of freedom fighters engaged and involved. And now you're just going to dismiss it as being some sort of uh, performative or some sort of, you know, political theater. That's not... Lawsuits are fine. Lawsuits are fine. But you need to get people out there. I mean, I've taken my son. He's eight. I've taken my son to protest the marches and, and just so him to see and feel the energy. I personally went to the Million Man March when I was 16 years old. And when I stood there amongst my brothers, two million black men on the Capitol, I said, man, this right here, this is what it's all about. And I never turned back. I never just, oh, man, I'm never doing that again. Those are life-changing experiences that we cannot rob the next generation or adults in our in our community from. We have to be on the front lines. And I'm so happy that we got an opportunity to have a platform like this. But more importantly, I'm so happy that there are opportunities for young people and the older people of our community to come together to organize and fight for change. Uh, ben Dixon uh, joins us right now. Ben, glad to have you uh, with the Ben Dixon uh, podcast. You broadcast from here this morning. And Ben, look, we, we cover a lot of these different stories and uh, sometimes there are 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000 or whatever. And, uh, and, and it's very interesting to me when, when I when I look at comments as we're broadcasting live. And people are like, ah, oh, this is a waste. Y'all out here for the white man. Uh, oh, this is this this serves no purpose. Uh, we got to do for self. I mean, so you hear all, all you yeah. know all the people who go back and forth as if if they were in the same situation. They would not be pleased if there was somebody who cared enough to travel near and far to be able to say, I stand with you. Right. And I think I I think people need to take a second and consider that if they were in that same position, that they would want everyone else to move heaven and earth in order to get justice for their family. And to take into consideration that we have the capacity of like what Brother Albright said before me to chew gum and walk at the same time. We have to multitask. We have to be able to hit this at multiple levels and multiple times because we're not getting hit from the system in one way. And so I I, I really listen to those kind of comments and I I really don't, honestly at this point, I don't pay them any attention because sometimes that means they're just really behind their computer at home uh, while people are out in the streets doing the work. Um, When we um, uh, look at at this particular 
uh, uh, trial here. And when you see the, the attacks specifically on this black family, attacks on black pastors uh, by, uh, by one of these attorneys standing up saying we needed more Bubba's who were on the jury. I mean, this was an absolute overt appeal uh, to white racism. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, it's not even talented racism. It's kind of like, it's kind of miserably pathetic racism. I'm like, at least we had, uh, well, they had. I wasn't around when Barry Goldwater was around, but he was creative with his racism. Um, <laughs> you know, these guys are, are, are getting kind of lazy with it. But the, all jokes aside, it shows you how far white supremacy or my, white mediocrity can get, actually. We saw it get all the way to the White House. We saw it now uh, having the nerve to speak against the institution of the black leadership, of, of, black, uh, of black pastors, rather, um, and having the nerve to speak so boldly and so ignorantly. And, and then I have to skip town and go over to Rittenhouse and see how, how ridiculous that judge is. Just blatant mediocrity smeared in our faces as if we can't see the absurdity of it all. Um, it, it, is, um, it, it is amazing to, uh, to watch this unfold. And what's also interesting is when I hear people say, look, things have gotten better. Racism is not as bad as it used to be. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's very easy to say that when you're not the one who's on the receiving end of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think who says that besides some uh, some white folks. Uh, if any black folks are saying that, I, I really want to know what side of the street they grew up on, um, what neighborhood they came from. Because no matter, honestly, I don't care what side of the street you came from, you face some kind of racism. Things have gotten better, clearly. But, you know, you know what did Malcolm say? You take a, a knife out of my back nine inches, but you didn't take it all the way out, right? By not taking it all the way out and then rectifying the situation. Um, I'm not just satisfied with them not being racist anymore. It's time to rectify all the mess that racism caused. See, that's, that, mm. that's why I love that line from the movie Malcolm X was, no, I'm not satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I think that's what the deal is. I mean, the, 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 the reality is, when, when I listen to the Bill Mars of the world, <laughs> when I listen to the Joe Rogans, well, first of all, I don't listen I don't to I was going to say, why uh, would you But when I hear guy? what they have to say, yeah. When I hear these different things, uh, it's this whole deal of, look, if things got a lot better, you should be satisfied. No, I'm not satisfied. What did Jackie Robinson, what was the name of his book? I never had it made. He said, as long as there's one black man who is not free, uh, I never had it made. You know, I, I don't know that I would be satisfied until, and I say this tongue in cheek, because I don't think we want our village idiots to ascend to the top of the mountain. But until our village idiots can get as far as Marjorie Taylor Greene got, as far as, you know, uh, uh, Donald uh, Trump Matt got. Matt Gaetz, Mike Gates, Paul Gosar, uh, uh, Louis Gomer, Come on. Uh, damn Joe, the whole Republican Party. Joe Manchin. Um, hell, Kirsten Cinema. Like, when mediocrity, uh, black mediocrity can get as far as white mediocrity, then maybe we could be satisfied. Until then, we got work to do. Indeed. Ben, we appreciate it, man. Thank Always you, good to see you. Thanks Pleasure. a bunch. Thanks for having me. Folks, got to pay some bills. We come back. We're going to talk about uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial. We're going to talk about the Julius Jones case. We're going to talk about the two brothers who were exonerated uh, for the uh, murder of uh, Malcolm X. There's a whole lot more to cover right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live from Glen County Courthouse, uh, where we are here. Three white men on trial for killing Amar Arbery. Uh, we'll be back in a moment on the Black Star Network.
Mary is saving big holiday shopping at Amazon. So now, she's free to become Bear Hug Betty. Settle in, kids. You'll be there a while. Ooh, where are you going? To give you something yeah. that's going to put you in that, you're going to remember this. Yeah, I was on tour. So Brian wanted to be the headliner. Now, your headliner was a new addition. So we're like, OK. You want to be a headliner? No problem. Listen, since so, you think you big, you that big a bad? OK. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget one night, we, uh, two of the guys, their driver got lost. I think it was Westbury we playing. And I'll never forget, um, we asked, they asked him if he didn't mind going on first, and uh, we, were, we were close out. And he, he came back and said, he said, no. I'll give him his prop. He took it like a man. <laughs> <laughs> it was rough out there. By the time he would come out, you could hear echoes. <laughs> wow. Know who Roland Martin is? He got the ask God on. He do the news. It's fancy news. Keep it rolling, right here. Rolling. Roland Martin. <laughs> right now. You are watching Roland Martin, unfiltered. I mean, could it be any other way? Really? It's Roland Martin. Folks, with hours to spare, the governor of Oklahoma, the Republican governor, uh, commuted the uh, death sentence of Julius Jones, uh, saying he will serve a life without parole. Uh, it was he was supposed to be executed at 4 p.m. Central Oklahoma time, uh, but the decision came down uh, around 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, joining us right now uh, is uh, Reverend C.C. Jones Davis. She is the director, campaign director for the Justice for Julius campaign. Glad to have. Uh, you back uh, on the show. Uh, it, it is, you know what? We frankly, let's just let's just call it what it is. Uh, it was cruel punishment yeah. for, for what this governor did. Yeah, for, forcing Julius Jones to have to go through uh, the final the final hours uh, of living uh, to begin the execution um, uh, process. Um, to wait this late, and 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 yes, people are appreciative uh, of, of what took place, but that was cruel. It was very cruel. It was very, very cruel. And um, that's something that we're not going to ever forget, you know. Um, the governor has had two opportunities to get this right, starting when uh, the pardon and parole board voted in September, on the 13th of September, that Julius should sit and should be commuted to life with the possibility of parole. He sat on that. And then he allowed Julius to get an execution date of November the 18th. And then there was a clemency hearing uh, put in motion for November the 1st. And since November the 1st, where the pardon and parole board uh, again voted the same way, the same people heard the same information and voted the same way, three to one, to recommend commutation with the possibility of life, with the possibility of parole. He sat on it until three hours before this execution. I cannot tell you what the Jones family has been through. I can't tell you what the rest of us who love Julius and care about his life have been through the last few days. It has been cruel. Are we grateful? Of course. It's past four o'clock here, and Julius Jones still has breath in his body. Yes, we're grateful. But good God, that man knew. The governor of Oklahoma knew what he was going to do. And he put us off and put us off and put us off and said, you know, I'm praying about the decision. Well, Roland, we've been staying on the ground all week long. There's not that much prayer in the world. God has already spoken through the pardon and parole board now twice. And the fact that he prolonged this and allowed these people to suffer the way that they did, the way that he allowed Julius to have to tell his loved ones goodbye last night, before 9 p.m. when his privileges were cut off, his phone privileges were cut off. I'm going to tell you right now, that's not something we're going to forget. 
the um, again, this is the scene that took place uh, outside the prison. Uh, I was uh, watching the live feeds of uh, Tamika Mallory, co-founder of Until Freedom, activist Tiffany Lofton as well. Uh, both were on the ground there, uh, and, and people people were rejoicing. And, and I know there's somebody uh, who's watching who say, "Oh my God, why are they rejoicing?" But the reality is this here. Um, had the action not at the parole board, not had those two three to one votes, had the governor not um, uh, made the decision today. Uh, right now, the family of Julius Jones would be planning a funeral. You are exactly right. And, you know, while this wasn't all that we wanted. You know, we believe that the governor should have taken the recommendation of his own parole board. Why do you have a parole board if twice they vote in the same way and you decide not to take their recommendation, right? But Julius Jones has breath in his in his lungs tonight. Uh, three hours, the decision was, was made public three hours before he was going to be strapped to a gurney. And uh, we're about to go to a prayer vigil. We've had a prayer vigil every night for the last couple months for Julius Jones. And we're not going to, you know, get to a place where Julius is alive and not praise God tonight. So we're going to be out there praising God in just a few minutes. But the fact that this governor waited that kind of time uh, and put this Jones family through what he's put them through today, this week, has, ha has, been, has been enormously negatively impactful. Um, it is certainly, uh, again, um, his family has been waiting for this moment. Uh, but to your point, uh, there's breath in his body, which also means that, sure, the governor said life in parole. But you know what? Right. There still could be hope to, to have the, uh, the facts of this case looked at. To, if you have the parole board say, hmm, there's some serious problems with this prosecution uh, and right. it needs to be looked at. Uh, and so we won't forget that. And so uh, what's next for the campaign? What's next for you? You know, we're going to take a deep breath. Uh, we're going to figure out where we are. Um, I don't know all of what Julius's legal options are right now. It could be possible that he could be up for commutation, applying for commutation in three years. Uh, but we have to really talk to his attorneys and reassess. And But right now, we're going to celebrate the fact that he's alive. And we're going to take a deep breath and figure out what's next. Reverend C.C. Jones Davis, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Certainly give our best to Julius and his family. Thanks for being, having me on. All right. Reese, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, going back to our previous conversation, it was the constant pressure. It, were, it was the petitions. It was the protest. It was getting celebrities involved. Uh, it was showing up at the hearings. It was showing up outside the governor's house. Again, you know, I just think that when people run their mouths, it's really a bunch of people who sit in their asses at home who frankly never put anything on the line for somebody else. Absolutely. I mean, you know, public pressure doesn't always work in these situations. I mean, the Republican Party is the party of death. It's the party of vengeance. It's, a, it's the party of bloodlust. And so the fact that at least the public pressure was able to um, persuade this governor Stitt to do the bare minimum, which is at least commute the death sentence, is actually a miracle of you know, of, of the hard work that activists and, and protesters and the families have been um, putting through. Uh, it doesn't always work, but it's always worth it to 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 make that public pressure um, happen because you know it's a life that's saved and that life is is worthy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just it, it bothers me when people try to diminish the work that other people are doing. If you don't want to do it, then you don't do it. But you don't have to diminish what other people are doing. Um, the fact of the matter is, this governor is up for re-election in 2022. And um, unfortunately, they have closed primaries in, in Oklahoma, and nobody has announced that they will run against this governor. But um, I would say that, you know, voters, particularly black voters in the state, 
need to make this a 2022 issue. I think he had that in mind when he did go as far as he did in terms of commuting the death sentence, but he did it in such a way where it's only a, that only a governor can um, intervene here and, and take it a step further because he ordered that it has to be life without parole. So this needs to be a 2022 issue. So that's where people who believe in the political process can join up with people who believe in the protest process and make sure that the next governor of Oklahoma finishes the job and freeze Julius Jones. You know, Faraji, um, a lot of things are done behind closed doors. They're done privately. But, you mm-hmm. know, my experience has been uh, sometimes people will say we're not making any headway. So we got to go. We got to go out there and do this thing publicly. And I, and I think also uh, this case is a perfect example and and I know uh, that, that there are people who say that there are people like Dylan Roof, they've committed horrible, horrible crimes. But this case is another example of why you got to get rid of the death penalty in the United States. Oh, no doubt. No doubt at all. And and I think that, that, that there needs to be a, a, another conversation about that. And I appreciate Reverend C.C. Jones Davis for at least acknowledging to take a breath. I mean, you have to celebrate the fact that, one, that Julius Jones is alive as we speak and and that you want to regroup. And in a lot of times people want to keep pushing, 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 wearing out the the, you know, the volunteers and all the folks that have been doing the great work on the ground. So you got to think about that. You got to have those larger conversations about the death penalty in this country and how they disproportionately affect black and brown people of this country. We got to have those discussions. But I, I want to make it very clear, because as much as we talk about the organizers, we can talk about politics of it, let's just be very, very clear. This governor did not have it in his heart to uh, grant Julius Jones clemency. He did. He waited until the 11th hour. For me, Brother Roland and the panel, this means that God literally intervened in this situation. This was a divine situation. Like, we couldn't... We. We, we, we protested. I signed the online petition. Uh, you know, of course, we talked about it here on this show. But at the end of the day, this man waited three to four hours before the execution. That means God had to literally intervene in this situation to change this man's thinking. Now, that just goes to show us that it's, it, is, it is super critical that we understand that because of the injustice that has been caused to black people in this country for over 400 plus years, that this is another example of why America is going through the same type of trials and tribulation that this country is going through. And, mm-hmm. and when you look at when a decision like this is being made, you can't just look at the decision as the, just the decision alone. You have to look at the mindset, the intention behind the, the decision. And the intent of this governor was not to save Julius Jones. But God had to intervene and save this brother and to use this as an example for us to wake up. I truly believe this. And I mean, look, I, I, I get the politics side, but we can't, we can't negate the spiritual side of this situation because we are in a very, very critical time in this country when it comes to race relations. We are in a very critical time when it's talking about granting justice to black people in this country. We cannot negate this, the divine being a part of this movement, this great fundamental change of uprooting white supremacy in this country. God is present in all of that we go through, all of the struggles. Our ancestors have been saying it. We have been praying for it. And guess what? It's happening. But guess what? Again, we got to look at, we got to see this, not just from one thing. We have to see this from many different angles, man. And I, I'm, I'm convinced only God could have intervened in this because this was the 11th hour. And we should not praise this governor. We should not support this governor. We should give this governor hell every turn, anytime he's trying to do something, whether you're white or black. If you are a person of conscience, you need to say enough is enough. You know, Greg, there were folks like Matt Schlapp of CPAC uh, who tweeted about this and saying that there were too many issues. Uh, they had reached out to the governor that uh, this action should be taken. And, and this is where I challenge those same white conservative evangelicals. Okay, where are y'all on the next one? Will you show up for that one? I mean, you can't just think that, oh, there's only one person who may not have committed the crime who's on death row. And it's amazing how most of them, when it comes up, they look like us. 
They do. They do. And I think that the nexus, one of the nexus points where the points that Reese makes with the politics of this and the spiritual dimension that Brother Faraji raises uh, meet at places like CPAC. And I'm going to say this, and, and I mean it with my whole heart. We're not praying to the same God. Mm-hmm. The CPAC mm. people, uh, their their God is white nationalism. Their their Jesus is white. Their God is white, and we are not human. Mm. Uh, right now, they are involved uh, deep neck deep. Donald Trump Jr. last week was down in Brazil at in the in the city of Brasilia campaigning for the re-election of Jair Balanzaro, who would consider himself a very deeply convicted Christian. He's a he's a white nationalist and an anti-human nationalist, and that same CPAC crowd is helping him, including a, a, a transnational white nationalist by the name of uh, um, Steve Bannon, who doesn't believe in any God, but does mm. believe in white supremacy. This is the God of the Ku Klux Klan. And, and as you were mm. talking, uh, Faraji, it reminded me of the favorite song of many of the marching forces in the United States colored troops during the Civil War. It wasn't the Star Spangled Banner. It wasn't Yankee Doodle. It was, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. And so when I heard Brother Jones' mother, Madeline Davis Jones, say, I will never stop fighting. The God she believes in is not the God of Stitt. You understand? Come on. Kevin, Kevin Stitt on. prays to a God of white supremacy. The attorney general he appointed, uh, who is now going to run, as you say, Reese, for re-election, uh, John O'Connor. Uh, John O'Connor, who was up for federal judgeship until he withdrew his uh, his nomination, his, until his nomination was withdrawn because the American Bar Association found him unqualified. John O'Connor is positioning himself for a tough election campaign against Gettner Drummond, they're, they're going to compete for who's the most white nationalist to run. Kevin Stitt didn't execute Julius Jones because Kevin Stitt understands. He counted up the cost. And there were too many people in the street. And these black people are not going to be turned away by appeals to a God and say, I stayed up all night praying. Rev was right. He knew what he mm. couldn't do. You have reached the limits. And I think this is very important to understand. So if you are a human being, and you're going to put this man to death, then you're not on the side of God. You are on the side of whatever you're praying to. We're praying against. And it just makes mm-hmm. me think about that. The last thing I'll say is, you know, the Oklahoma Department of Corrections released what uh, uh, Julius Jones would have ordered for his last meal. Two Kentucky Fried Chicken sandwiches with lettuce, tomatoes, and tomato, and mayonnaise. One large McDonald's French fry with salt and ketchup. One medium at, or small as budget allowed, meat lovers, pizza from Pizza Hut, and a bottle of water. Julius Jones' last meal order is a metaphor for what we have done in this country far too often, which is set our sights too low. Kevin Stitt, you get no credit. Mm. Because our opposition to you is cultural, is spiritual, and what we witness today is you being overwhelmed by the fact that the tsunami's coming, man, and you can count. And we are going to move on up over you. If you had put him to death, it would have escalated a conflict just like you're covering in Georgia, because we are now past politics. This is a war, and we're not going to lose. Come on. Come on. All right, folks. uh, We talk about how police uh, uh, impact black men. What about black Girls, the Marshall Project uh, has a new story that deals with that. We'll talk with uh, the reporter next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment from Glen County, Georgia. Alexa. Play our favorite song again. Okay. I only have oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. 
Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Well, you should pick something stronger that's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision. An SUV built around you. All of you. Once upon a time, there lived a princess with really long hair who was waiting for a prince to come save her. But really, who has time for that? Let's go. Fill I'm filling myself. She ordered herself a ladder with Prime One Day Delivery, and she was out of there. I want some hood girls looking back at it and a good girl in my tax bracket. Now, her hairdressing empire is killing it. And the prince, well, who cares? Prime changes everything. Hi, I'm Gavin Houston. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. E Folks, uh, we often talk about the impact uh, of police violence on brothers, but they also impact sisters. Uh, The Marshall Project, they conducted a study that found black teens are more likely to be on the receiving end of police violence than any other group, particularly black girls. The data comes from six large police departments and found that black girls make up one-fifth of the violent interactions with police in comparison. Their white counterparts only represent 3% of cases. Uh, The Georgetown Law and Poverty Center study found that black girls were seen as older and less innocent uh, than their white peers. Joining us right now is Abby Van Sickle. She is uh, with the Marshall Project hailing out, out of Oakland, California. Abby, uh, that last point I think is important because oftentimes black girls are are highly sexualized. And so therefore they aren't treated the same when they are being sexually assaulted. Uh, the, the, these differing standards, these sort of, uh, you know, one standard for white girls and one standard for black girls, uh, it's, it's clear and evident when you look at uh, these numbers. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So we, when we were trying to understand the impact of police force on, on girls, um, and uh, we started looking at these six police departments that gave us their data. The difference between black girls' experience and white girls' experience really stood out right away in the numbers. And then we tried to understand sort of what that actually means for someone's life, um, what kinds of long-term trauma uh, that can cause. And so we, inter- we interviewed families and girls from around the country about their experiences when police have used force. And we're talking about, you know, force, including handcuffs, guns pointed at them, pepper spray, um, takedowns on the ground. And uh, and those experiences were, you know, incredibly powerful. And so we used that um, coupled with the data to try to, you know, reach people to understand what this um, what these interactions can, can really mean for people. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that. Um is important is that, again, when we look at these cases, we often talk about, especially when uh, someone has been uh, killed, uh, we often talk about black men. Uh, but what's often overlooked uh, is exactly what's happening with uh, black women who are also being uh, victimized at the hands of police. Yeah, so just to be clear, when we looked at those departments, um, black men and boys stood out as you know the far most common group to receive police use of force. Um, but when we started to take a look at girls, it seemed like you know black girls just had such a different experience than white girls, and that seemed to be you know an important point that hadn't been highlighted um, you know as much. And so we reached out to you know academics who had studied this, um, including as you mentioned Georgetown. Um, there's a professor there, uh, Kristen Henny, uh, who had really focused on on this in a new book that she has. Um, she talked about adultification, how when um, you know when they have researched girls and how they are viewed, um, that white girls are oftentimes viewed as younger, black girls as older, and how that can really play into police interactions. Um, if police are you know, encountering a child or a teenager and viewing them as older than they really are, um, and that can have some really serious repercussions um, in, in terms of the force that's used and how that interaction goes. 
uh, questions for my panel. Reese, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I guess my question is, you know, what what's next? I mean, we know that, you know, black girls are over-policed. I mean, this didn't really go into incidents involving security guards or school resource offices. Um, officers, did you have any insight into um, how black girls are being treated by police in the school system? Yeah, so there's been, you know, some some really excellent reporting about school resource officers and the the way that um, that kids encounter them, what kind of force those um, those officers use. We didn't look specifically at the experience in schools, but just as we were researching cases and reading about, um, you know, different experiences that schools came up, you know, time and time again. Um, you know, that's where uh, that's where kids are spending so much of their time, and so the kind of encounters that they have there can also be really life-shaping. Faraji. Abby, thank you so much for doing the work with the, uh, the Marshall Project. And um, I definitely, you know, took some time to kind of read through all of your data. One thing that really stuck out for me, though, is this idea. It, it was mentioned in the 2017 Georgetown data when they said that there is no comprehensive national database of violent interaction between police and civilians. But when we looked at data for six large police departments that provided detailed demographic information on use of force incidents, we found nearly 4,000 youngsters 17 and under experienced police violence from 2015 through 2020. So I guess I kind of have two questions in regards to that. One is, we've been talking about this adultification bias, but how do we push the needle forward to having to creating a national database? And then two, what's being done when, when Black girls, in particular, 17 and under, are being put in these positions, objectified, mis, uh, you know, abused? Um, you know, what can be done locally from the community standpoint? Yeah, so in terms of the national database, you know, uh, there is not a national database of use of force incidents. We looked at the publicly available data for, we, try, we started with, um, you know, the 50 largest police departments in the country, and there were six that provided data that would let us even look at this question in a detailed way. And, you know, policing in America remains largely local. Um, you know, there are 18,000 uh, local policing agencies, and they have their own systems, um, not a national database. And you know, it would be I think quite helpful in trying to understand, um, you know, how, which departments are using which types of force. How many, uh, you know, are there differences in the way that police departments are using force in the number of kids that they're encountering? All of those are questions that there isn't at this point a national database to be able to answer. There has been, you know, more attention on um, on building databases around fatalities, but here we're talking, uh, you know, sort of everyday encounters with police that can still lead to really life changing trauma. And um, and as to the point about local, um, you know, local communities, as I said, policing is local, and local police departments uh, and local leaders are accountable to, you know, to local communities. And so I think that's that's sort of the the point that I'd raise on that. Thank you. Greg. Uh, thank you, Roland, and thank you, Abby. You know, I had an old professor, Anderson Thompson, he used to call these kind of, uh, this kind of research what he called death watch studies. In other words, we count the bodies as we're assaulted and kind of move on to the next thing. I really would ask you what you think might be some out-of-the-box solutions. And looking at the, the opening discussion of Brianna Stewart there in, in, in Hagerstown, the fact that she had to write a letter of apology and then they dropped the charges, I mean, because she cursed at a police officer, uh, when we we all know that you can say whatever the hell you want to a police officer if, if you're not black or brown, uh, perhaps. I guess what I'm really asking is, is a broad question. It goes back to something Reese raised. Is there a solution in your mind? Because even at the local level, when you talk about police officers having the excuse that they are scared of someone because of their physicality, even 100-pound girls, and then one of the police uh, departments said uh, they're young and inexperienced, they left out white, but um, can police be reformed? And in your mind, what would be an out-of-the-box solution to this adultification, which really, quite frankly, is baked into this system since it really started when the first black girls got off the boats and were treated like women for the purposes of reproduction? 
Well, when I'm doing reporting, I always try to find sort of what, you know, is there a place that this is better? Is there a solution? How, you know, how might this change? And, um, and I did talk with, you know, some experts who are training law enforcement agencies uh, on trying to, you know, understand better how to interact with kids, how to interact with young people. One of the things that came up in sort of interview after interview with families and, and kids is that they felt like the interaction just sort of escalated super fast. Um, from something that was like a kid saying something back to an officer to suddenly they're in handcuffs, they're on the ground. Um, in Brianna's case, you know, they're pepper sprayed. And um, and they, they all talked about, you know, is there a way that a, an officer could call a parent? Could they have called my parent? Could they have slowed it down? Could they have diffused rather than escalated? Um, and the experts I talked to said that, you know, they, they're working on trying to train officers to do that. Um, but that's it, it's not every department in the country that's had that training. It is, um, you know, they all discussed a, a long road ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Abby Van Zucker with the Marshall Project. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, folks, got to go to break more from Glenn County Courthouse uh, here in Georgia. I'm Roland Martin. Uh, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Don't forget, download the app. Our goal is to have 50,000 downloads by December 31st. Apple phone, iPhone, uh, Apple phone, Android phone, Android TV, Apple TV, uh, Xbox. Uh, you got Roku. You've got Samsung TV, all Amazon Fire Stick, all those platforms. And, of course, Please support us. Your dollars are making it possible for us to be able to travel here, hire the crews, and give you kind of the coverage uh, that we uh, that you richly deserve. Of course, our goal is to get 50, 000, uh, 20 thousand of our fans to give an average of fifty bucks each uh, over the course of a year. That's four dollars and nineteen cents a month, thirteen cents a day. Uh, and Co, you can do so. Cash App Dollar Sign R M Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is R M Unfiltered. Zell is Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. To give you something yeah. that's going to put you in that, you're going to remember this. Yeah, we was on tour. So Brian wanted to be the headliner. Now, your headliner was New Edition. So we're like, okay, you want to be a headliner? No problem. And I said, since you so, think you big, is you that big a band? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget one night, we, uh, two of the guys, the driver got lost. I think it was Westbury we were playing. And I'll never forget, um, we asked, they asked him if he didn't mind going on first and uh, we, we would close out. And he, they came back and said, he said, no, I give him his prop. He took it like a bag. <laughs> <laughs> it was rough out there. By the time he would come out, you could hear echoes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Maureen is saving big holiday shopping at Amazon. So now she's free to become Maureen the Marrier. Food is her love language. And she really loves her grandson. Like, really loves. My name is Charlie Wilson. Hi, I'm Sally Richardson Whitfield. And I'm Dodger Whitfield. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond. And you're watching Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. <laughs> Well, folks.
folks, we do this every single day in order to bring attention uh, to um, African Americans uh, who uh, come up missing. Unfortunately, they don't get the coverage they need, such as the case of Madison Harris. A 15-year-old Madison Harris was last seen leaving her house in Chicago September 6th of this year. She is 5 feet 1 inches tall and weighing 115 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing... A dark blue long sleeve shirt, black pants, uh, pink UGG slide shoes, and carrying a black bag. Anyone with information regarding her, please call the Chicago Police Department at 312-746-6554. 312-746-6554. Folks, today a Manhattan judge overturned the convictions of two men uh, who went to prison for killing Malcolm X. Uh, during the hearing, uh, Muhammad Aziz uh, said the 54-year process had taken a toll on him, and he hopes the system will take responsibility for what they did to him, as well as the late Khalil Islam. The event that brought us to court today should never have occurred. Fellow defense were and are the result of a process that was corrupt to its core, one that was all too familiar to black people in 2021. While I do not need this court, these prosecutors, or a piece of paper to tell me I'm innocent, I am very glad that my family, my friends, and the attorneys who have worked and supported me all of these years are finally saying the truth that we have all known, officially recognized. I'm an 83-year-old man who was victimized by the criminal justice system. I do not know how many more years of creative activity I have. However, I hope the same system that was responsible for this travesty of justice also takes responsibility for the immeasurable harm it caused to me during the last 55 or 56 years. Thank you, Your To Mr. Aziz and your family, and to the family of Mr. Islam, I regret that this court cannot fully undo the serious miscarriages of justice in this case and give you back the many years that were lost. This court's mandate requires that the judgments of conviction be vacated and that the indictment against Mr. Aziz and Mr. Islam be dismissed. The joint motion is hereby granted and the record... The son of Khalil Islam, Shahid Johnson, said he is still sad because his father did not live to get to see this day. Uh, the fact that he's not here, it brings only a little satisfaction because um, I was in my mother's belly when he was taken. So for 25 years, there was no father-son connection except through, you know, visitation rooms. So the fact that it almost sounds casual to me that he's being exonerated. So the great pleasure is not there because he's not here with me. So in the fact that we, the family suffered growing up with concerns of fear of, of people coming after us or to, uh, you know, watch, walk in school, looking over my shoulder, you know, those kind of things you can't get back. You know, so normality was gone when I was 10, you know, because in 1975, we were forced to, to leave where we lived because it was assumed that someone was coming after us. So my childhood was over at the age of 10. So right now, this is, is great, but not so great at the same time. You know, so I am, I am happy, but there's still sadness, you know. So that's how I feel. Faraji, the FBI, uh, the NYPD, uh, they uh, withheld evidence. Uh, if there's any reason to take the name of that son of a bitch, J. Edgar Hoover, off of that building, this should do it. If Democrats had any courage, they would actually pass a bill stripping his name from the headquarters of the FBI. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you on that, but I don't see that happening. I mean, I, I think that um, that this situation here 
you know, the judge said it's a miscarriage of justice. This is not a, just a miscarriage of justice. I mean, we're talking about 56 years. We're talking about two black men who, in, who were in the nation of Islam who basically, I mean, if you're in the nation, I grew up in the nation, you heard the story of Malcolm X, you hear it about his rise and fall, the, the whole thing. When you hear about the killing of Malcolm X, it, it strikes a nerve. I mean, even to this very day, Malcolm X is one of the most revered, revered uh, uh, black leaders that we have ever produced. And certainly he's one of the, the one of the shining stars of the great teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And of course, his connection to the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. So when we look at this right here, I'm with the son of brother uh, Khalil Islam. It just doesn't feel like celebration. It just feels like he said, it's just like this. I mean, it's just something being said. We say, oh, exonerate. It's just a term being used. But when you are not, when you're not alive to see that your word is made, uh, uh, is believed in, then there's no exoneration. When you're not able to really, uh, 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 I guess the best way, when you're not able to really experience the fruit of freedom, that these brothers had to, that didn't experience for 56 years. Brother Muhammad Aziz, he's an older man. I mean, he was blessed to see this day, but 56 years has been taken from this man. And let's look at the reality. We know J. F. Hoover had infiltrated the ranks of the Nation of Islam to have Malcolm X killed. We know that he exploited the pain and the hurt and, the, and, the, and created uh, an environment within the ranks of the nation of Islam through his agents because of all of the turmoil between Malcolm X and his great teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. We know that. And yet this country is just getting to the point to say, oh, these black men didn't do it, but they never got to the real part of it, which is that the United States government killed Malcolm X. The United States government, through J. Edgar Huga and his COINTEL program, his counterintelligence program, was a, a, a key part of the murder of one of our great heroes, that the United States government continues to do surveillance on Black leadership to this day. So when we talk about this, this right here is just words. And, and it doesn't, and, and for those of us who say, oh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan had something to do with it, get the hell out of my damn face, because the history will show you he never had nothing to do with this. So this is a very serious situation. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy for Brother Muhammad um, Aziz to get some level of, of freedom from this. But the pain, the wounds are so fresh, they're still open. And, and this has caused such a rift within the Islamic community and within Black people that it's going to take us some time to really see this. But let's not forget that the real enemy is not the nation of Islam. It's not even the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. The real enemy is the United States government because they sold the, they saw, they sowed the seeds of dissension to create the environment to kill one of our Black leaders. Greg, the only reason this happened is because uh, Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance was able to get his hands on the unredacted uh, reports from the FBI and from the NYPD. Uh, I am a firm believer uh, that President Joe Biden should completely declassify and reveal the unredacted papers on Dr. King, on Malcolm X, on any African-American who was a victim of COINTELPRO. That would be wonderful if these files were inactive in terms of the strategies being used, uh, but they're not. Black people, many black organizations rather, are still considered open enemies of the federal government. The counterintelligence program didn't shut down. It just transformed. You know, the conversation about black radical extremists and, and so forth. I mean, go back to the 1920s, something called racial condition, the Ray, the Raycon files. This is where John Edgar Hoover, coming into what was then the military intelligence division, uh, which became the FBI, cut his eye teeth on Marcus Garvey. Uh, we are still enemies of the state. Um, you know, Cyrus Vance gets no credit for this. Um, in fact, uh, as the brother said, this is bittersweet. It's not even bittersweet. 
uh, Faraji is right. The real culprit is uh, you know, the federal government, and not just the United States government, but the international government. And Malcolm X wasn't allowed to, to land in France, in part because the French didn't want him assassinated on uh, French soil. That's CIA. I mean, there's an international <laughs> conspiracy. Now, that does not, however, let black people off the hook. As John Henry Clark used to say, in some stories, there aren't any good guys. Now, I think that the, the best single mm. book on this, my, my dear friend, uh, Paul Lee, out of Michigan, who's probably, for my money, the best researcher on Malcolm X breathing today, and would probably, in fact, would defer to Peter Goldman, who wrote uh, three editions of a book called The Death and Life of Malcolm X, and who, in fact, interviewed, interviewed Talmadge Hare, who was in prison, who was one of the assassins, who named the five who killed and said that uh, Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson, Muhammad Aziz, and uh, Khalil Islam were not two of them. They've been bringing this up since the 1960s. And you fa in fact, if you read Zach Kondo's book, Conspiracies, Unraveling the uh, Assassination of Malcolm X, Zach Kondo appeared in the Netflix um, kind of popularization of Twice Told Tales, with all due respect, to the Netflix producers of Who Killed Malcolm X. Nothing in that documentary was new. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the brother they call Shotgun Man, William Bradley in Newark, remember Ras Baraka is in the documentary saying, everybody knows who the guy was. They, they bragged about it. But, but, but I'm raising this for this point. We have to understand there are two tracks of lessons to learn here. The, 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 the less important of the two is the, uh, is the state apparatus patting itself on the back and, and really washing themselves of the real complicity from boss, as uh, as uh, as Brother Abdul Rahman talked about last night on your show, they, they, the, the Autobahn was riddled with agents, and no one did anything, including the man who tried to give Malcolm mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation while Betty is there and Yuri Koshiyama is there, and that is the agent Gene Roberts who was on the damn platform as he died. But that that is a conversation that should bring us finally to the main point, and that's an internal black conversation. So when Malcolm said, after the house was firebombing, mm. when he said that, you know, Elijah Muhammad said, don't touch that man. But Elijah Muhammad Jr., in front of hundreds of Nation of Islam members, including the Fruit of Islam, said, this man's tongue should have been cut out and delivered to Chicago. Why is he still alive? Let's be clear. There was a hit on Malcolm X. The Nation of Islam had not the whole Nation of Islam, but you got people who are trained to execute these things. And Zach goes all through it. But the names, I won't even read the names, but I will mention that Talmadge Hare, who was locked up, who talked to Peter Goldman, who Zach tried to interview several times, he named the five killers in a petition that Aziz and Islam sent to the Congressional Black Caucus in 1979 asking them to open an investigation. Jagger Hoover's name's not coming off that building because too many black people in America have confused black America with white America on these subjects. Malcolm X was hated then, he's hated now. Now that he is safely dead, like Martin Luther King, they can praise him and pat themselves on the back for taking the lives of two other men through time spent in prison. Nobody gets any credit. We should be having this conversation with ourselves, and until we do, that wound is never going to heal. Mm. Reese, I'm sorry you got to follow that. <laughs> I hate when I have to follow Dr. Carr because he's always so on point and Faraji. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I cannot um, I cannot state anything better than Faraji and Dr. Carr have. But I will just say that, you know, the exoner exonerations are always welcome. They're always necessary. But the damage has been done already. I mean, we're talking about families, children, marriages that have been torn apart as a result of these false accusations. And they're still happening. I mean, we go from exonerated from, from these two men to, I mean, from Julius Jones earlier, who's who has been exonerated by the evidence, but not exonerated in terms of his his now life sentence. And so the harms are still being perpetuated over and over again. And it, I'm, I'm just tired of hearing about 70, 80 year old black men being, um, you know, cleared of the charges that they were falsely accused of. And, and, and that's just, all I, have. I don't have any solutions. I don't, I don't have any, any, anything positive to say other than it's, it, it just continues to be horrific and tragic. Mm-hmm. 
Folks, uh, up next, an update on the trial of the former cop who killed uh, Artiana Jefferson uh, in Fort Worth. That and some other headlines. Next, Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live from the Glen County Courthouse in Georgia, right here on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. <laughs> Alexa, play our favorite song again. Okay. I only have eyes for you. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger. That's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me, Me too. too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision. An SUV built around you. All of you. Once upon a time, there lived a princess with really long hair who was waiting for a prince to come save her. But really... Who has time for that? Let's go. Fill I'm feeling myself. She ordered herself a ladder with Prime one day delivery. And she was out of there. I want some hood girls looking back at it and a good girl in my tech break. Now, her hairdressing empire is killing it. And the prince, well, who cares? Prime changed everything. Hey, everybody, it's your girl Lunel. So what's up? This is your boy, Earthquake. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, a few headlines here. Uh, the uh, trial of the former Fort Worth police officer who shot and killed Artie Allen Jefferson, uh, that has been rescheduled uh, again. Uh, first of all, in January, Aaron Dean will face a jury for shooting Jefferson uh, in 2019 for entering her home when a neighbor called to report her door was open for a wellness check. Dean did not announce he was a police officer uh, when he entered Jefferson's backyard. Uh, the Jefferson family, they filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Fort Worth. Again, that uh, trial is going to take place uh, in January unless it gets delayed again. Louisiana, Gov Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards uh, will pardon Plessy after a unanimous vote by the Louisiana Board of Pardons. Now, in 1896, Plessy refused to leave a whites-only uh, train a car, uh, leading to the separate but equal law. Now, of course, uh, this is Homer Plessy, the landmark Plessy versus Ferguson case, getting this posthumous uh, pardon. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that as long as accommodations were equal, they could remain separate. This led to the separation of housing, schools, and other public, public facilities for nearly 50 years years and so uh glad to see that uh let's go to south carolina where south carolina city is going to pay six hundred fifty thousand dollars to a 58 year old black man uh after reviewing and reviewing police policies that clarence gilliard was walking with a stick wrapped in a shiny tape in july when someone mistook the object for a gun and what did they do call 911 on the brother Investigators say Officer David Lance Dukes ordered Gail Yard to the ground and stomped on his head and neck when he didn't immediately drop. Duke was fired and charged with first-degree assault and battery. Mm, mm, mm. And the man who was the subject of a Supreme Court case that extended the possibility uh, of freedom to hundreds of thousands of people uh, since the life of that parole is juveniles, well, he is now free 58 years later. 75-year-old Henry Montgomery was released from prison just hours after being granted parole on Wednesday. He was convicted in the 1963 killing of an East Baton Rouge Sheriff's deputy who caught him skipping school. Montgomery was 17 at the time. That, that, that right there is, is, again, it shows you uh, how heinous and cruel America is, Reese, uh, where it took a Supreme Court decision to say, uh, what the hell are we doing? Literally sentencing juveniles to life in prison. This man was 17. He's 75 years old now. It, it, again, like it's a common thing that we've been we've been discussing, you know, tonight. And I mean, 75 years old. I mean, this that was practically a death sentence given the the the, the life expectancy of a black man. Uh, thank God he was able to survive long enough to 
to, to get out and, and get free. But I mean, this is just, it's just sickening. I, I don't even have any other words and just sickening. Greg. No, I agree. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, you know, this brother who did kill Charles Hurt, the fact that he spent almost 60 years in Angola and that prison in Louisiana is named for the region in Central Africa where many Africans were taken through the port of New Orleans into enslavement. They, that, that's, how, that's how black that prison he was in. They literally named it for the place in Africa enslaved Africans came from. You know, it, 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 the Miller versus Alabama case in 2020, 2012, which said that, you know, you can't sentence juveniles to life. And then 2016, it was his case, Montgomery's case, that uh, led to that being applied retroactively. And, and in the time, in this time period, there were over 800 people who had been freed. Uh, but the fact that we're having this conversation, and, and I'll end with this, Louisiana is, is one of the most unique but representative states in this country when it comes to this question of punishment. When you mentioned Homer Plessy, uh, who was one-eighth black, who volunteered on that committee, that Citizens Committee in 1890, I guess, three or four, to go buy the ticket and get on the train because he looked like he was white. <laughs> and that's how he outed himself on the train. Louisiana has always policed black bodies. The simple fact of the matter is Montgomery was up for parole twice since that case and rejected twice by the state board. And as you were reading the Plessy case and talking about Homer Plessy, you know what? I wonder... How many people in Louisiana today would say, don't pardon Plessy? Racism's a hell of a thing, man. They're going to hold on this until the last dog dies. And, and so mm. it's good to see brothers out. So, But we got a lot more work to do. And Louisiana is a hell of a case study in how race operates. Mm -hmm. Faraji? I mean, I, I think of uh, when, when I heard the saying that, you know, democracy in this country would not be in the place... It would be it, the, the the place it's in right now, and, and unless there were the, the the struggles of the oppressed, oppressed people has pushed this government, this form of government of democracy, to the place that it's in. It's on the backs of black people. It's on the backs of oppressed people in this country that have provided the rights that people enjoy, that have provided us to the gains that we have made in this country. And so when you look at Henry Montgomery, who spent all of this time in prison, I mean, you can't pay this man enough money no. for the time that he has lost. What you going to pay him? What can you say to him? What can you do for him? I mean, the only thing he can do is just say thank you, keep it mm. moving. But mm. but but it, it's 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 the fact that I mean, throughout the night we've been seeing how these how the justice system has to go so far. You have to go to the Supreme Court to get basic justice because in the city or the state that these incidents occur, they're not providing justice to anyone. And so it's like, how, when, when is enough enough? When are we in this country going to believe that, the, that Black folks in particular do not get equal justice under the quote-unquote law of this country? When, when, when will enough be enough? We talk about it, Brother Roland. You always profiling. You always on seeing about these things. But when do we really, really internalize it, Dr. Carr, for me? Yes. That, that yes. we actually get to, to the point that say, you know what? We got to stop putting so much faith in the justice system. And I know Black folks love to throw out the word accountability. We got to hold people accountable. We got to hold <laughs> people accountable. But guess what? When you look at the laws, the laws come out of the, the hearts and the minds, the beliefs and the attitudes of men and women, particularly more black, uh, white men. So mm -hmm. if you don't shape, if you don't uproot, if you don't change the belief system that exists in this country, whether it's around black girls or black boys, we will never get justice. If you don't uproot white supremacy from the mind of an individual, it never will change. So, I mean, I, I just think that we got to get out of this thinking that, you know, things would just change on the policy side without understanding that there can be no policy until we change the mentality of those who create the policy that keep us oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, was, that, was that you with an amen, Reese? 
I didn't say it, but I will say amen. <laughs> no, I'm not, no, I, I, no I, I, I heard somebody. No, no, I, I, I heard somebody say thank you. And I was like, hey, hey, hey. Okay. <laughs> might be one of those right. ministers down there, man. Uh, so I got, Danny, right, watching the show. That's what it is. <laughs> Uh, I got I, I got to go to a break. Uh, we'll be back. Roller Martin on the field on the Black Star Network. To give you something yeah. that's going to put you in that, you're going to remember this. Yeah, we was on tour. So Brian wanted to be the headliner. Now, your headliner was a new addition. So we're like, okay, you want to be a headliner? No problem. And I said, since you so, think you big, you that big and bad? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget one night we... Uh, two of the guys, the driver got lost. I think it was Westbury we playing. And I'll never forget, um, we asked, they asked him if he didn't mind going on first and uh, we would we close out. And he, he came back and said, he said, no. I'll give him his prop. He took it like a man. <laughs> <laughs> it was rough out there. By the time he would come out, you could hear echoes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> saving big holiday shopping at Amazon. So now she's free to become Maureen the Marrier. Food is her love language. And she really loves her grandson. Like really loves. Hello everyone, it's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're we're SWV. SWV. What's up y'all, it's Ryan Destiny and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, we're here at the Glen County Courthouse in Georgia, where today uh, a number of black pastors gathered uh, as a show of force uh, in response to some comments made last week by the white attorney for one of the three white men on trial for killing Ahmaud Arbery. That that uh, uh, Kevin Gold, he said he did not want black pastors in the courtroom, specifically calling out Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and Reverend Al Sharpton. Well, that led to black pastors saying, fine, you don't want to see them? How about all of us? Here is some of what took place today at the Glen County Courthouse. I came to this trial to console them because you can't imagine the pain of a mother what? to sit there and look at the killers of her son yes. and their families yes. and nobody sitting there with her. The pain of a father yes. who won't get a call from his son anymore. Yes. I did not come in the courtroom to protest, I came to pray that they would have the strength to stand up. Now, I do protest, but I came as a minister. And this man, the next day, defiled me for coming and said, why was I there that we must have an agenda? Yes, our agenda is that the God we serve would give strength to this woman and this man and this family. All uh, right, folks, uh, that was Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, we also heard from um, Amal Arbery's parents. I just want to say thank you to all the pastors who traveled near and far to come and just to be with us in this very, very difficult, difficult time. God is good. 
when Ahmad was killed on the 23rd of February, I, the family had some of the darkest times of our lives. We asked questions, we got no answers. We, we submitted emails with no reply back. But in the midst of all that, I prayed. I asked the Lord to somehow tell me what happened to Quez. And my daughter talked to me like weeks after and she said, Mom, we don't even have an attorney. Mm. Mm. And I prayed, I told Jasmine, I said, when the Lord get ready for us to have an attorney, we'll get one. Mm. Amen. Not until then. Amen. I just want to say thank you. My heart is full of just joy in the midst of this broken heart. I just thank you guys, and I love you all. So I'm just saying thank you to all y'all people that came out here and support this family, yeah. all these pastors. Yeah. And we know Quay has been killed wrong, but look at the chain he broke. Yeah. He brought a chain with a knife. God got his way of pulling that devil out the hat. God had to use his life to pull that devil out the hat. Yeah. <laughs> to make this world brighter for other kids. So other kids can run, won't get killed. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. God did this. So I'm going to tell Quay, we love you, but Quay resting now. Yeah. But guess what? That devil got to pay now. Right. Y'all got to pay. Y'all told my family up. Y'all told us up, but look what you did to your own. You told yours up too. Because guess what? If you'd have had a heart, you'd have let him keep running. You would have never took no gun to a baby. A, a, a what, 12-gauge shotgun? In a 357 Magnum? You took that to a baby. You shot a gun you took an animal down with. You shot him with. And you think you did something right? I hope God be with you, but I don't think he is. God, we're praying, people. God bless all y'all people being behind my family. And I thank y'all. God's good. Yeah, yeah. And that was Ahmaud Arbery's sister who first spoke. That was that, uh, the mother. Uh, we, we uh, of course, we, we told you about uh, the march that took place from the courthouse uh, to uh, down the street uh, to the Ahmaud Arbery mural. Uh, Barbara Arnwine, founder of the Transformer Justice Coalition, uh, we uh, got a chance to get a few words from her as she was marching uh, in the streets. And so uh, here's what she had to say. Barbara, why do y'all do this every Thursday? Why do y'all do this every Thursday? Because this community has been scared into not supporting the Arbery family. People's jobs have been threatened. People's lives have been threatened. So we are out here to say it's safe to come out and support the family. Come out and do this. Because if it were your son, if it were your brother, if it were your uncle, your cousin, you would want somebody to be out here for you. You would want somebody to be out here for you. So that's why we're here. We're here to make sure that this community knows it can show up and look at them showing up and showing out. A bunch of things high yes, we march with community members joining in. This is why we do it. Uh, and so uh, there were uh, a, a number of folks out there. Uh, Y'all can go to the video right now. Uh, and uh, there was uh, some young kids out there that were carrying the signs. Go back to the iPad, please. Uh, there were some young kids uh, who were carrying the sign. I had to have a little fun with them. Wow. So, again, so they got young folks out here, adults behind us. Uh, so you see the transfer just just still issue a sign. And so, what, no, 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 oh, oh, not, not you not, oh, now you trying to wave? I didn't wave. I said, oh, I said, I said, I said, I never said, I never wave. Yeah. Really? Right. You, you said stuff I didn't. Say. What you talking about? You said stuff I didn't. Now you, now you know we live streaming. Yeah. yeah. TV, TV tells him I didn't. I didn't. You did. I, yeah, you, I made a wave. You, you made want to play the video back? Play it. I'm I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. He got a whole lot to say. You, you trying to be a lawyer one day? What you want to be one day? They don't get no peace. They don't get no peace. That little kid, that, that little kid had, uh, his name was Jamie. He had a whole lot of mouth on him, Reese. I, I think he must be related to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, 
I, I, the mouth, yes, but keeping the story straight, I keep my story straight. I don't know. <laughs> 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 I just have to say, um, you know, it's so important. We talked about the power of protest. We talked about the power of showing up. The power of black media, I know Dr. Kari said this earlier in the show, is so important because those black kids need to know that their presence matters to people beyond the people that they're looking right. at. And, you know, forget about what's on CNN and MSNBC and they want to rerun the same hack jobs and horse race coverage about, you know, who's up and who's down. This is what matters to Black people. This is what we're all focusing on in terms of making sure that Ahmaud Aubrey gets justice. And so thank you, as usual, we say this every week, thank you for being there, representing our community, and shining a light on things that actually matter to us. Uh, we'll certainly appreciate that. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I'm going to do a real quick break. Uh, then we come back. We're just going to share a little bit more uh, from uh, when they were at the actual the mural uh, that that is not far from the courthouse here. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. <laughs> Alexa, play our favorite song again. Okay. I only have for you. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. It's something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger. That's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me, Me too. too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision. An SUV built around you. All of you. Betty is saving big holiday shopping at Amazon. So now, she's free to become Bear Hug Betty. Settle in, kids. You'll be there a while. Ooh, where are you going? I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. I must say, uh, Faraji, uh, it was great to see uh, the young brothers and sisters out there. You see, uh, there was a young white girl who was out there. And in fact, as we were as we were coming back to the courthouse, there was a boys and girls club. Well, they it was about twenty or so little kids, and they had them all lined up, and they wanted them to also see folks uh, marching down the street. I just thought that that was important. Uh, uh, again, uh, imagine uh, if you're one of those kids, because here's the reality: um, Amal Arbery was that age at one time, and so uh, it's important, I believe, that our kids and white kids and Latino kids and Asian kids uh, be out here and understand uh, that uh, their voice matters as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and, you know, we looking at, you know, I see one of the banners had the great John Lewis on the front. John Lewis was a young man when he came to be a part of the civil rights movement under Dr. King. Um, he was a young man when he, he decided to, you know, to walk those streets down in Selma. And so when you're looking at these, uh, these little brothers and sisters, and even the little white girls saying protect the vote and all of those signs, I mean, this is the type of, of mental uh, shifting that we have to do. And those little brothers that you talk to, Brother Roland, they will never forget that experience that they were a part of this march, and then more importantly, that they were leading the march and they were talking to you while leading the march. They won't forget that. And so what that just did was you just planted a seed. What those marches do, they plant a seed to those children because they may not all understand, of course, all of the dynamics of the case. They don't understand all of this, the situation about race relations, but you can know that they, they, they feel like they, when they hear those messages, Black Lives Matter, one of our YouTube watchers said Black Love Matter, when they're talking about, you know, protecting the life of Black boys and Black girls, that's going to sink in. 
and you we, we just in a march, it could just turn them from 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 being the destructive and self hating to a place where now they're serving and loving each other, and then and I mean you can't you can't. There's, there's nothing that is more powerful than that type of experience. They can't teach that in the classroom. You got to bring the children. And when there's an opportunity to get our babies involved, if the, if the marches or protests are safe and, and secure, bring the children out, especially the young boys and young girls around seven, eight, nine years old. Have those conversations with your children, because guess what? They're going to grow up to become grown men and women. And if they say, my mama and my daddy took me out, my uncle took me out, my grandmother took me out, we always fought for freedom. I mean, being a freedom fighter has no age limit, Dr. Carl Reese. We all know that. And all of us have been awakened because someone took us under their wings early on. Dr. Greg Carr wouldn't be the great Dr. Greg Carr unless somebody exposed him to some, right. some level of knowledge, took him and said, look, I think, Greg, you need to be here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Reese wouldn't be Reese Colbert if somebody didn't expose her and say, Reese, I think this is part of your mission, you know, as being a woman and having your voice heard. We all have been exposed as children, so we can't diminish that. We can't just say, oh, man, that doesn't matter. Let's wait till they get to be teenagers. You got to do that real early. And Greg Carr, uh, he turned 80 years old uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, Go ahead! Um, I I I I I can tell you, Greg. Um, you know, I've my goodness, I, I've I met Reverend Jackson easily thirty five, forty years ago. Um, and I, it's hard to actually describe um, the look in his eye. Uh, we were marching. They pulled up. Uh, I was in the SUV, and he made it clear that he was going to march with the Transformer Justice Coalition and with these children. Now, now I want people. Now I want people to understand, and I'm not, and I'm, and this is no criticism, but I need y'all to realize that behind me, behind me, go to the wide shot. Go to the wide. You should have a wide shot. Go to the wide shot. Y'all should have a wide shot. It's camera here. Okay, so behind me, this is where the news conference took place here. And it was jam-packed, and people were here. And then they went across the street where they had a gathering place for a rally here. But when it came time for that weekly march, 99% um, of the people who were here, the pastors here, um, did not – March down the street, but but mm. this was Reverend Jackson, and I, I can tell you, Greg, um, his folks, that the watchers step, they 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 were very careful. There were a couple times where he stumbled, um, but I can but I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, it was uh, he was adamant that he was going to get out of that car and walk with those children. My God. I, I could hear it in your voice, Roland, what that does. And just, and again, everybody, the Black Star Network, we, like Reese just said, I mean, but we can't say it enough. This is why this space has to thrive and exist. And this is why you've built it, Roland. Just a story in the last 15 minutes of footage, brother. You know, Jesse was, what, 28? Around mm -hmm. that when Dr. King was assassinated. And as, as the stories always go, you know, Jesse was the one who would jump down in the middle of it. The North Carolina a t football star quarterback who is in the movement now. And they would say often in meetings, it was Dr. King who could hold order on Jesse because Jesse was ready to roll on everything. And sometimes Dr. King would have to get him and come, hey, man, come sit next to me in the meeting. Just come mm -hmm. sit down. There. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ahmaud Arbery was only two, three years younger than Jesse when he was killed in the street. And, and mm -hmm. to watch that footage of intergenerational will, Jesse is going to do that until they take him 
from here, and then he's gonna be doing it on the other side. That's just who he has <laughs> always been. But but to watch you, brother, walking down the middle of the street with your arm casually draped around that young brother, that is not a male threat to go back to that policing story that you covered. That isn't a man. That was a little boy. Now he's a little boy with a lot of mouth, but the man who had his <laughs> arm around him was showing him how to use that <laughs> mouth. The way you just <laughs> what you just said, Roger, and, and making this, I'm saying this to make a point. When you see that kind of coverage, of course, as Reezy said, that's not going to be on white stream television because you know, they would be sticking a microphone in that little boy's face trying to expect him to sound like a man. But what you just tapped into, brother, is something that Jesse out of South Carolina taps into, you out of Texas taps into. And what Marcus Arbery did reminded me so much of uh, Emmett Till's great uncle Moe's right. That is the eloquence of the South. <laughs> he he tapped into that thing. He said, you know, no, my son, he called him by his nickname, Maud. He's okay. But now you tore your own family up. He called mm. the devil out. He, he, that man set natural fire to this system. And those white girls who were there with those signs, those are the white girls who the police will not harm that we were mm. talking about earlier. But something mm. between their age they are right now and the time they mm. become adults, has to change in this society so that they will never leave that street until the society is reconstructed. And that those children can grow up, as you said, uh, as you said, uh, in, in Faraji, in a system and in a society where they will celebrate their differences, they will embrace their cultural variety, and they, but at the same time, they will stand in front of anything and bump for each other because they will not allow themselves to live in a society, as Mr. Arbery said, that will have you stand somewhere and kill yourself because you decided that somebody who doesn't look like you deserves to die. That was a remarkable <laughs> 10, 15 minutes of footage, brother, because it told a lot of stories at the same time. And that's why the Black Star Network is singularly unique. <clears throat> Ray said, I want to give you the final com uh, comment. I I'm, I'm seeing some of the comments from people here. Uh, and, and let me just say, some of y'all are talking about Reverend should take better care of himself. Y'all know what the hell y'all talking about. Wow. And then somebody said, Rev Reverend needs to be in a wheelchair. Let me say this again. <laughs> Shut the hell up. <laughs> y'all don't know what y'all talking about. Hmm. Okay, for all y'all people sitting on your ass at home right now, I need y'all to understand, Reverend, and look, it's hard to hear Reverend because of his Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And it gets later in the day when he is tired, it's even harder. But I need all y'all people who are running your damn mouths and, oh, it's embarrassing Reverend out there. When he came to the car, and I went to say bye to him, and he pulled me closer. And he said, Roland, we're involved in three actions. <laughs> he, said, I've been, he said, I was at Howard University. That's right. Where he fell and bumped his head, went to the hospital, got out of the hospital, went back to Howard University. That's right. And the next day went to Indiana to stand with the family of Jelani Day That's right. and that mother and then it's being here. So at 80 years old with Parkinson's, still mm. difficult to walk, difficult to talk. When he was, they were walking out here, uh, Reverend was sweating, had the heat. I, ra I, I ran and grabbed my umbrella. I said, hey, get the heat off of Reverend's head. Use an umbrella. Mm -hmm. He's still here. Right? Yeah. He is not going to sit in a wheelchair as long as his legs work because his deal is that's what he's always done. Mm -hmm. So all y'all people sitting here running your mouths who don't know nothing, y'all ain't out here. Hmm. I have looked, I, I'm telling y'all, we were there in Austin at the March for Democracy. I remember. When he went out there and walked and marched multiple right. times. He wasn't there for the photo op. So some of y'all need to show some goddamn respect. <laughs> For our elders yes, who have been putting it on the line, who, who can easily sit at home and look around the, the house and all the awards and everything, yet they are still on the front lines. That's what some of y'all need to understand. Reese, go ahead. Close us out. 
Mm. Look, at the end of the day, if you have a problem with what Reverend Jesse Jackson is out there doing, then here's a suggestion. Retire him. You retire mm. him. Come on, Reese. Mm, come, come on. At 80 years old, he shouldn't have to be out there, but he's a man that's walking in his purpose and thank God for him. God bless him. If you're that concerned out there, then go land your shoulder for him to lean on. Go right. hold that umbrella, as Roland said. A lot of people can sit at home and criticize people who are putting their body, their lives, especially we're in the middle of a pandemic still. He just recovered from, from COVID. He has Parkinson's. He recovered from a fall. He's putting himself on the line, and all you got to do is fake concern for him. Retire him. Retire mm. everybody that's out there on those streets. We got to beg and plead people to do the basic shit, like vote and do all this other kind of stuff, and people still criticize people who are out there on the streets in between elections, who are actually mm. putting their 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 feet to the pavement and doing the work that we don't have to do because we're not out there. So if you have a suggestion, my suggestion for you is retire Reverend Jesse Jackson, <laughs> retire Cliff Albright, who so he doesn't have to spend the night in jail, retire a hundred pastors having to come down there and and, and comfort another black family who has lost a loved one whose son has been lynched. And that's a tall order. It's a lot easier to punch down. It's a lot easier to, 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 to complain about a person's individual action than it is to fix the system. So as Roland said, and I'll echo him, shut the hell up. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, I had some. I I had some, I, I had some food talking about. Oh, watching the video, Roland was struggling. Bring your ass out here, and see if you can keep up with me. <laughs> what? <laughs> people just are. Bring your ass out here, right? No, but I love the people. Come on out here and let me see if you can hit this thing at seven thirty in the morning, and be here at eight twenty two. And work for the past uh, 13 hours. Let's see what you can mm. do. Again, mm. real easy to sit your ass at home. But let's come on and see if you can sit here and carry a, carry a tripod, set some equipment up, shoot some video, fly a drone, and also hit with the march. Bring your ass. <laughs> see, that's the whole deal here. And see, Reese said it best. This was a lynching. No what question. happened to Amar Arbery was a lynching. And the mm -hmm. problem that a lot of black folks today is you don't have the same integrity that black folks had when Emmett Till was lynched. Come. And mm. so you would rather go on back to watching your reality show or watching Ooh. some other TV show or playing some video games when other folk are willing to come here and stand with the family. And so for the haters, I ain't worried about it. I remember I heard what Ahmad's daddy told me directly last night. Come on, brother. And some of y'all need to pay attention because we need more of us on the front lines versus some of y'all who's sitting at home watching this and saying they should be doing this and doing that. Mm -hmm. Bring your ass if you got something to say. Greg, Reese, Faraji, I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Hey, folks, uh, we got to bounce. Uh, I will not be with us tomorrow. Uh, I will be in New York City uh, doing some interviews for Rolling with Roland. I'll be talking with Michelle Roberts, who is executive director of the National Basketball Players Association. She's retiring at the end of the year. I'm sitting down with Will Downing, Melba Moore as well. Next Wednesday, we're not going to have our show the day before Thanksgiving, but we're going to be launching uh, the first episode of Rolling with Roland, uh, our new one-hour interview show on the Black Star Network. I'm sitting with Johnny Gill. It's an amazing interview, and wait until you see the surprise at the end of the interview. You don't want to miss that. At 6 p.m. Eastern, we're going to drop it on next Wednesday. Uh, my conversation, Roland, the first episode of Rolling with Roland with Johnny Gill. And also, Inland Empire, California. I'm flying, uh, talking to the, let's see, who am I, the, the group I'm talking to. I'm literally doing the interviews in New York. Again, some of y'all want to talk. Yeah, let's see if y'all got stamina. Uh, so we leave at 6 a.m. to go to New York tomorrow for the interviews there. And then Saturday, uh, I am speaking at the Sierra Lakes um, Golf Club. Man, I'm speaking at a country club, and I ain't even playing golf. Uh, it's the Neighbors United of the Inland Empire. They're a holiday lunch and fundraiser. They sold out all of the tickets. Uh, and so they, they I told them, I said, I appreciate that. They said, no, we appreciate you. So I'm going to be there. That's on Saturday. And so, again, uh, Ray, uh, my man Ray Baker is sitting in for me tomorrow. I still want y'all to watch. But there's only one flight that gets me 
to the to Inland Empire in time to catch uh, for my speech uh, on Saturday morning. So I got to leave New York tomorrow night at 7.30 uh, again. So we're heading to New York in the morning uh, to the National Basketball Players Association. Where we're going to do our interviews there, so we're looking forward to that. So rolling with Roland next Wednesday, talking talk with Johnny Gill. We're going to stay on the case, uh, covering the news and issues. And next Friday, yes, we're going home for Thanksgiving Wednesday and Thursday. We're going to be live from New Orleans from the Bayou Classic uh, as well uh, with coverage all weekend, partnering with Coca-Cola. So we got some great things going on. Let me shout out uh, our uh, new partners on the show, Verizon. Thank you so very much. Also, thanking Nissan, Buick, as well as uh, Amazon. Thank you so very much. Folks, that's it. That's it for us. I know we went over time. Sorry about that, but it's a whole lot uh, we had to cover. And I need y'all to understand, we were, we've been literally going since 7.30 this morning, bringing it for you. And that's why we created Black Star Network. Please, why do I want y'all to support the show? So we can hire more staff. So I ain't got to do 13 hours myself, along with Antoine and Deshaun, and along with uh, Frank and Dredd. Uh, folks, uh, we picked up a couple of our fr freelancers we brought in here as well from Atlanta. I appreciate them. Please, y'all, support us via Cash App. I'm telling y'all, I'm, I'm telling y'all, let me, let me, hold up. Yo, go, 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 um, uh, if, if Greg and Reese if Roger's still there, hey, go get my gray bag. Get my gray bag out of the car. Let me tell Okay, let me tell y'all something. Hold on. Let me find it. I need y'all to understand who's watching that y'all think I'm joking when when people roll up on us. I need y'all to understand how our people feel about uh, this show. This is no lie. This brother is a pastor here. Hold on, I need to airdrop it to my iPad. I, I need you to show y'all this. This is no lie. Brother walked up to me today. I keep telling y'all, this happens all the time when we go around the country. This brother walked up to put his Bring the Funk fan club money in my hand. Listen to this. All right, y'all. Uh, so tell everybody who you are. Leroy Jordan, Pastor Bart Camp Missionary Baptist Church. Where is that? Uh, we're in Midville, Georgia. All right, so y'all, so he rolled up on me. He said he wanted to make sure he uh, contributed to the Bring the Fuck yes, Fan sir. Club. Yes, sir. We're watching. We're great player of heels, and we just appreciate what you're doing for our community and what you do for the nation. All right. Keep it up. Rolling. I appreciate it. We love you, man. Thanks a bunch. And this is all the way from Bart Camp Missionary Baptist Church in Midville, Georgia. I appreciate it, bro. Amen. Thanks a lot. Amen. I appreciate it. Okay. Y'all, so straight up, that brother came up to me and gave me a $20 bill. A sister here, a sister, she walked up to me, and she just put this in my hand. I, she, hold on, let's see. 20, 40, 60, 80. A sister walked up to me. She put $100 in my hand. So I told y'all, our fan base is so phenomenal, and they support this show. And and and, and y'all think I'm sitting here uh, joking. Yo, and I just need to tell y'all real quick. I'm serious, and this is why I need y'all to support the show, okay? We had to get us a new generator. Our previous generator did not have a fuel gauge, all right? So we landed Jacksonville, drove to Brunswick, Georgia, went straight to Home Depot, spent $3,000 on a new Honda generator. That you can barely hear, has a fuel gauge on it so we know whether we have gas or not. That was $3,000. So our fan base, that's what they do. I'm telling y'all. Every time we go somewhere, they walk up and put cash in my hand, and the woman didn't even give me her name. She didn't even want her name known. I don't even know her name. She just put the money in my hand. I was so busy, I didn't even count it, and they just brought it to me. She put $100 in my hand. So um, trust me when I tell y'all, your support for this show pays for that generator. Pays for the gas for the Sprinter. Pays for our freelancer. Pays for our cameras and lights and things along those lines. That's why it matters. And so if y'all can support us, it doesn't matter at what level. She gave 100 The other preacher gave 20 Y'all, it's still $120. So please support us. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Folks, that's it. Uh, we got to go. We got to get some rest. We'll see y'all we'll tomorrow. Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Holla! To give you something yeah. that's going to put you in that, you're going to remember this. Yeah, we was on tour. So Brian wanted to be the headliner. Now, your headline was a new edition.
So we're like, okay. You want to be a headliner? No problem. And they say, since you so, think you big, you that big and bad? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'll never forget one night we, uh, two of the guys, the driver got lost. I think it was Westbury we were playing. And I'll never forget, um, we asked, they asked him if he didn't mind going on first and uh, we, were, we were close out. And he, they came back and said, he said, no. I give him his prop. He took it like a man. <laughs> It was rough out there. By the time he would come out, you could hear echoes. <laughs> wow. to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. We support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own. A Black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay Black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Alexa, play our favorite song again. Okay. Oh. 